Peter, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I suppose I'm audible to the whole, yes? All right. Well, um, so if, if, I, if at any point I'm not heard, just yell, right? Um, so I want to begin by, by thanking uh, Andrew, Hervé, and Filippo for this opportunity uh, to speak at this conference. And truly, I am very, very grateful uh, to the three of you and uh, to the organizers at INDAN for uh, making whatever arrangements uh, uh, possible to enable uh, those who could not travel to participate in this conference. I know our numbers are small, so thank you very much. Uh, right, so um, you've seen the title of my talk. I just want to point out that all this is collaborative work with Andrew Zimmer and my former student, Onroy Moitra. Uh, by this, I mean it's not collaborative work involving a group of three, uh, but work involving groups of two at two separate times. Uh, right, so with, with that introduction, let me begin. And I want to make the point that this talk is dedicated to a, a, a synthetic notion of negative curvature. Uh, that is given by the behavior of Kobayashi geodesics in a domain in CM. Although I do want to point out that uh, in many cases, it is unclear whether we have actual geodesics for the Kobayashi uh, distance. Uh, so the question arises, well, okay, fine, but why? Uh, why this, this notion, which of course I have yet to define, and uh, the answer is, well, it's useful. It is a notion that tends to outline, uh, underlie various results. And I'm going to talk about one of them, namely the wolf dangean theorem. Uh, but I do want to point out that at no point of time am I going to give the proof of any form of a wolf dangean theorem. This will be a framing device for us because um, you will hear more about uh, uh, versions of this theorem uh, further later on in this conference. Uh, the point I want to make is that uh, sort of a negative curvature viewpoint enables the generalization of the classical result in many, many directions. Uh, so let's state the classical result. Um, everyone is familiar with it, but let's run through this really quickly. Uh, if you have a holomorphic self map of the open unit disk, then you have this sharp dichotomy. Either F has a fixed point, and in that event, we can actually completely describe uh, the, the uh, behavior of the fixed point and the orbits of F under iteration. Or if, if there isn't a fixed point, then it has to be the case that there is a point on the unit circle. This is called the wolf point for F, such that all orbits under the iteration of F run off to the wolf point. Also, uh, in this latter case, the convergence is uniform on compacts. Uh, so you've heard this more than once already in this uh, uh, conference that analogs of the above result are known for non-expansive self-maps for proper uh, Gromov hyperbolic metric spaces. Uh, I want to spend some part of this talk uh, talking about aspects of Bearden's work uh, which again you've heard mentioned uh, yesterday, because uh, his work is among the earliest that I am aware of that clarifies the metrical aspects of this classical result. Uh, so let's look at, you know, I talked about uh, generalizations in all sorts of directions, uh, a metrical aspect to the proof. So let's look at a generalization and let's look at certain attempted generalizations that fail. Uh, so in higher dimensions now, uh, this is a result that concerns strictly convex, bounded strictly convex domains in CN, call such a domain omega and let F be a holomorphic self map of omega. So the result I'm stating is a result by uh, Bujinska 
uh, also proved from a different perspective by Abate and Raisi, which, if I remember correctly, enables a weakening of the hypothesis. So again, you have this dichotomy, as you saw in the previous slide, either F has a fixed point in omega, or there is a wolf point. Uh, again, that means that any orbit uh, under the iteration of F is, is drawn towards the wolf point. And again, in this case, in the latter case, the convergence is uniform on compacts. Uh, now, strict convexity provides various advantages. Uh, and I'm going to come back and briefly hint at what those advantages are. But now let's look at uh, ways in which the gen generalizations of this phenomenon uh, fail. Uh, so it's it's right. It's good to good to understand directions in which generalizations don't work, since they give us a hint in the directions that that they work. So uh, uh, so that's that's the whole idea here. Uh, now, let me pause for a minute because I want to set myself an alarm, if you don't mind, because I tend to do sense of time. Give me a minute. Okay, much better. Hmm. Excuse right. me, Gautam. Yes, go ahead. Um, when you say strictly convex, you mean uh, having some boundary regularity, right? Um, that C1. is right. So by strictly convex, uh, no, I actually uh, uh, mean in the sense that uh, strictly convex means if you have two points on the boundary of a convex domain, then and you know that the line segment joining those two points uh, is, is, in, is in the closure of the domain, then those two points have to be the same. Another way of saying this strictly convex uh, without any C1 regularity simply means that there are no uh, non-trivial non line segments in the boundary. So yes, you are right, it is a, it's a, condition on the niceness of the boundary. Uh, but uh, this does not presuppose C1 smoothness. Do you, do, you, do you see what we mean by strict here? So this is okay. geometrically strict. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Right, so uh, I was talking about non-generalization. So here is a really simple example. So there are no fixed points, but there is no wolf point either. Now, this is, this is a really simple example that, that everyone can see coming from a mile off. Take your favorite animus and let the holomorphic map F simply be a rotation. Now, here's something a little more complicated. You have a domain. Uh, now, the previous example, remember the previous example, involve a non-simply connected domain. Convex domains are, are, are simply connected. So let's look at an example where the domain is simply connected, but there is some orbit of the iteration of a holomorphic self-map that has a large cluster set. Uh, so here is, briefly speaking, here is how you form omega. You start out with the open unit square uh, in the plane, and you remove horizontal line segments uh, in the Cartesian product of minus one to one times minus one to zero. In other words, the bottom half of this square. And you remove them, you remove these line segments in such a way that there is a geodesic ray. This is a geodesic with respect to the Poincare distance that emanates from some point in the positive half of the imaginary axis that accumulates on the bottom edge of, of omega. So that's, that's omega. And then you, you, you take some biholomorphism of omega to itself with the property that F maps gamma of t to gamma of t plus one. And then for this map simply by construction, the, uh, the orbit that starts out at this point on the imaginary axis, I tau naught, uh, that orbit accumulates on all of the, the bottom edge. Now, here is an example where um, somehow we begin to intuit that we have to worry about the boundary of the region to, to get something like Wolf-Dajois. 
And um, if you rem remember your prime ends theory and the title of this talk, there's the word visibility that ought to be suggested. Okay, but I'm going to move on and get back, circle back to this uh, a little later. Okay, so uh, how does the classical proof work? So the classical proof itself has, has aspects of metric geometry. And the key, key step is to show that if F does not already have a fixed point in, uh, in, in the interior, in omega, then there is a unique point on the unit circle such that for every positive R, F maps the horror disk at the point P of radius R into itself, all right? Um, now, going beyond D, so for instance, uh, the, uh, the result you saw in the previous slide, convexity becomes very useful because uh, if omega is convex, then um, uh, a holomorphic, if you have a holomorphic self-map, convexity enables something similar to what, what you saw over here in the previous paragraph, uh, and again involves objects uh, that are determined by the Kobayashi distance. And then strict convexity, and strict convexity is in the sense that I, I mentioned, geometric strict convexity uh, ensures that these generalized horribles uh, meet the boundary at precisely one point. Okay, so that, that having a one point intersection is what uh, makes the boundary cluster set uh, 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 non-degenerate. Um, what are these generalized horribles? I'm not going to go into that, but you heard a mention of this in Carlson's talk uh, yesterday. These are the, for instance, an example are the, the small and large horribles of Abate. Uh, well, uh, all of this doesn't provide too many clues of how we proceed using the algorithm that's sort of implicit in these top three lines if we drop convexity. Uh, but then uh, it turns out that the, the, the proof of a result that I'm going to now state turns out to be very, very insightful. But I do want to point out that in the result, this is the result by Bearden, uh, convexity is somewhat incidental, all right? But uh, an appropriate uh, notion of negative curvature is all important. So here's the result. Uh, let omega be a strictly convex domain in Rn. So this is, we are talking about real convex domains. This is not a result in the holomorphic category. And let F be, uh, let F be a strict contraction, let F be a self-map that is a strict contraction with respect to the Hilbert distance. Now I'm going to come back to what the Hilbert distance is. Then there is a point P in uh, the closure of omega such that all orbits of, of this strict contraction are dragged towards this, this one point, uh, all orbits, so regardless of, of the starting point of the orbit. Um, so this, as I said, turns out to be rather instructive to, to the, the schema that I want to talk about. Oh, and also, like in the last two theorems, this convergence is uniform on compact subsets of the map. So I am now going to compare uh, the universe of uh, uh, discourse of the theorem that I just stated, and then come to the adjustments in our scenario, because uh, my, my framing device, remember, is the a, a wolf d'argeois for holomorphic self-maps. Um, I do want to point out that um, I am foreshadowing, but very superficially, something that I believe is going to be talked about in considerable detail on Friday uh, by Alexandra Huchek. I, I hope the pronunci my pronunciation is correct. Uh, so, but, but repetition is good, right? So, uh, so I am not going to fixate on the hypothesis of the theorem that I just stated, but we, we step back for the purposes of motivating the concepts in this talk 
take a step back to look at the requirements for Bearden's proof to work. So our requirements are to have a metric space X and a good compactification. I'm going to come to what I mean by good or what Bearden means by good in a moment, but by a compactification, I mean a compact Hausdorff space in, into which uh, X is, is in topologically embedded. Moreover, I require the boundary that is, so by the boundary, I mean the compactification minus X should have at least two points. So now here's what we mean by good. And this is why I said we need at least two points in the boundary. Uh, you, you look at two distinct points in the boundary and you consider two sequences, X mu and Y mu. X mu converges to the boundary point psi and Y mu converges to the boundary point eta. Then goodness means that uh, for some base point in X, the distance the difference between the distance between x nu and y nu and the greater of the distances between the base point and x nu and the distance between the base point and y nu, this difference should go off to infinity. So you, you saw this statement preci precisely this condition in, in, in Carlson's talk uh, yesterday evening. Uh, so Gromov proper Gromov hyperbolic spaces have, have this property. And then the third requirement for the whole machinery to go through is, is, a, is to have a map, a self map of X that is a strict contraction. So now let's look at the adjustments in our scenario. And they are as follows. Uh, I'm going to fix a particular compactification and what I'm going to take is I'm going to take, given a domain omega, uh, what is this? Uh, given a domain uh, omega that is Kobayashi hyperbolic, that means that the Kobayashi pseudo distance is a true distance on omega. I am going to insist on my compactification to be the endpoint compactification uh, of omega closure. Uh, I'm going to give a rigorous definition of this very soon, but uh, a, a suggested example would be consider, uh, say, an infinite strip in the plane. Uh, then uh, the compactification would be the topological space that picks up all points of the topological boundary, but also picks up two additional points. Uh, these are these uh, represent the two quote unquote ends of this by infinite strip. So I'm going to insist, and I'm going to come back on this insistence. Insistence, I'm going to insist on my compactification to be the end compactification. Then our distance is going to be the Kobayashi distance. You can kind of guess why, because I told you that our scenario involves holomorphic self maps of mega. Uh, but then we encounter a slight difficulty right away, which is that uh, the condition on Bearden is something we cannot assume anymore. Because if you th think for a moment, uh, the condition on the left, which is now struck out, is going to imply that uh, the metric, that X is a proper metric space, which is to say that, that uh, uh, closed bounded sets are compact or equivalently. Well, um, let me talk about the Kobayashi distance. This is the whole problem. This is the year 2021, and it is still unknown in general when this particular function, fix a base point in your domain and look at the function, which is the distance from the base point. It is still in general unknown when this is proper, even for extremely nice pseudo-convex domains, okay? Uh, so in that sense, what I'm going to talk about going forward differs much considerably from much of the literature because uh, the, 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 the metric space omega equipped the Kobayashi distance can, can no longer be assumed to be geodesic. Right, so the third requirement corresponding to the column on the left is our self-map is polymorphic. And simply to reinforce 
why I want uh, uh, the underlying distance to be the Kobayashi distance, because that makes any holomorphic self map a, a contraction, a, a semi-contraction, not a strict contraction, but that's a minor difficulty. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the, the, the column on the right is the schema that determines uh, the notion of negative curvature that we are interested in. Uh, let's see how I'm doing on time. All right. So um, I, I remember when I mentioned uh, Bearden's result, I mentioned uh, the Hilbert distance. So let's sort of take a very rapid trip through Hilbert geometry, uh, very rapid, very superficial. Uh, consider a bounded convex domain in Rn, n greater than or equal to two. So uh, the Hilbert geometry is a, 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 a synthetic geometry. It's, it's a geometry built up from axioms where uh, the analog of lines that we are familiar are given simply by, by uh, straight lines, straight and Euclidean sets. Uh, but then intrinsically, what does it mean? Or in particular, if we want to metrize uh, uh, the convex domain omega, uh, metrically, this means, first of all, that uh, if I fix a couple of, if, if I consider a pair of points P and Q, then the distance between P and Q must go to infinity if P approaches, I'll tell you in a moment what P infinity is, or if Q approaches Q infinity, and there we go. So P and Q are the points at which the, the line joining uh, P and Q intersect the boundary of the given convex domain. But th that's, that's not the only way in which the lineness of these horizontal lines is captured metrically. The other property is that the triangle inequality between three points on what I have declared to be lines uh, must, must be an equality, right? Uh, so there is, there is a uh, positive semi-definite function that realizes both of the properties. So this, this is that object. And I talked about how the cross ratio enables that the triangle inequality between three points on a line becomes an equality. So the cross ratio is, is this ratio that you see. And if you look at this uh, written just the right way, uh, if you have three points, you are going to have the log of a certain ratio that occurs with a plus sign and a minus sign. They cancel out, which is what gives uh, the causes the triangle inequality to become an equality on, on lines. And uh, uh, Hilbert had like a purely synthetic proof to show that this positive semi-definite uh, function in fact, satis satisfies the triangle inequality. So this is the object. Uh, by the way, I might be off by some constant, okay? I might be off by a positive constant, but the substantive properties uh, are given by this formula, which is the mod of the logarithm of this cross ratio. Hmm? Right. Recall the I see there is a question. Yes, carry on. I don't think you need the, the, the modulus here. This is always positive. This is always going to be positive. Good, good to know. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, I want people to know the similarity with the Poincaré distance and how so. Um, well, maybe a picture will help. So let me transition to the next slide and then uh, I'll, I'll come back and say, uh, complete, complete that sentence. Uh, but, uh, well, well, what was that sentence? I wanted everyone to note the similarity of what I had just written with the Poincaré distance. And I'm now going to exploit that similarity that I am going to clarify in a moment uh, by showing a way in which the behavior of the geodesics uh, for the Poincaré, uh, uh, Poincaré metric and the Hilbert, the Hilbert metric on a, 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 a strictly convex domain 
have a certain similarity that is going to be our notion of negative curvature for the stop. Right, so pictures. Uh, so this is the upper half space. And uh, the topological boundary, which is the real axis, also happens to be the, the ideal boundary viewing, uh, viewing the upper half space equipped with the, the uh, Poincaré distance as a negatively curved space. Uh, so I look at two points, psi and eta, and I consider two neighborhoods in the closure of the upper half space. Uh, that are well separated, which is that their respective closures are disjoint. Mm -hmm. uh, then notice what happens. Uh, there exists a K, this is a compact set in the upper half space, such that every geodesic that originates in one of these neighborhoods and ends in the other does the following. And uh, I'd suggest you look at the picture rather than go through the, the text. So this is what happens, okay? So uh, also please note the order of the quantifiers, which is that your, our data is a pair of points and a pair of well-separated data. So given this data, there, this data determines a compact so that these geodesics, all of these geodesics intersect, okay? All right, so uh, the similarity I was talking about is if we declare in the upper half space model of, of, uh, uh, of um, hyperbolic space, I declare our lines to be these vertical rays, parallel vertical rays, and the semicircles that intersect uh, the x-axis at uh, right, well, semicircles will, in semicircles, let's say that again. So if our notion of lines are these vertical rays and semicircles terminating on the x-axis, if we declare these to be lines and in this formula, we determine P in, given a point P, we determine P infinity and given a point Q, we determine Q infinity analogously to this picture, but with our lines to be either these semicircles, then formally, the formula for the Poincaré distance is precisely the formula for the, the, the Hilbert distance with the substitutions that I just described. So in the strictly convex case, exactly the same thing happens. It should be pretty clear when I talked about the, the metrical notion of lineness that given a pair of points, the, 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 the straight line segment joining this pair of points is a geodesic for the Hilbert distance. So uh, the picture is exactly the same. Uh, I have a C and I have an eta. These are two distinct points. I have two neighborhoods, u psi and u eta, and these are well separated in the sense of uh, the description above. Then exactly the same thing happens, provided, provided our domain is strictly convex, which is that given these four items of data, two points, two well separated neighborhoods, every geo there exists a compact so that this happens. Every geodesic originating in u psi and terminating in u eta meets this compact. And in this case, you know, uh, it's really the picture that is the proof. Uh, I want you to know that, that it is strict convexity that enables uh, the existence of this compact. And also to notice that if we did not have strict convexity, for instance, uh, in, in this picture, if consider, imagine I had a polygon here, then line segments that are parallel to the edge of the polygon can be arbitrarily, can, can originate in one of these neighborhoods and terminate in the other and be arbitrarily close to the topological boundary. So uh, 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 this, this property of, 
of geodesics is sort of almost encoded in the visual geometry of this picture. Right, so uh, that is our setup. And uh, now I want to recall that, that two column analysis and look at now the elements on the right hand column. So uh, we talk about the Kobayashi pseudo distance and the Kobayashi pseudo metric. Uh, I have this formula up here, but then this is something that everybody in this audience knows. Uh, the facts for future reference that are important to us is that uh, the uh, for the open unit disk, the Kobayashi distance is the Poincaré distance. The other thing is that the Kobayashi distance is the integrated pseudo distance associated with the Kobayashi pseudometric. And then, although I have stated this in an earlier slide, I, I want to make a big production of it. The issue with the setup that we are interested in, we, we are interested in arbitrary, not even necessarily bounded Kobayashi hyperbolic domains in CN. And it happens that we do not know in general, given a Kobayashi hyperbolic uh, uh, domain, whether that domain equipped with the Kobayashi distance is even Cauchy complete. Not even if you, if you ask for the given domain to be pseudo convex in, in dimension n greater than or equal to three, this is still unclear. All right, so, um, um, what does this mean in, in the language of the previous slide? By the hop, so um, the, uh, a domain, a Kobayashi hyperbolic domain is a length space. So by the hop Renov theorem, not knowing whether, whether this metric space is Cauchy complete means that the existence of geodesics with respect to the Kobayashi distance is in fact unclear. So we have to rectify this. We have to do something about the fact that it isn't clear whether we have geodesics of the Kobayashi distance uh, connecting a pair of points. So uh, we rectify the situation by defining uh, the following. So let's start off with the Kobayashi hyperbolic domain. I'm going to fix a lambda greater than or equal to one and fix a constant kappa greater than or equal to zero. So an almost a lambda kappa almost geodesic is an absolutely continuous path in omega, which satisfies this condition, which is simply to say that uh, that sigma is, is a lambda kappa quasi-geodesic, but in fact that it is a nice quasi-geodesic. It is absolutely continuous, which means almost everywhere I can talk about sigma prime, but the the Kobayashi length or the, Ko the Kobayashi length of sigma Welcome. prime. Yes. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, your voice is very unclear. Uh, I, maybe did, I repeat. For, yes. You get the, the... Because I'm getting an echo, so everything is being washed out. Yeah, I, I repeat the, the question for you because, uh, well, it's the room that amplify echoes. Mm -hmm. um, so Constantine asked whether uh, the fact that it's not Cauchy complete uh, prevents the, even the local existence of geodesic. Um, let's see. Probably. Uh, uh, so, again, the, the echo is just drowning things out. Uh, sorry if I can uh, say a comment, but the, yeah. the, the topology is still the same. So, um, the space is locally uh, compact and therefore mm -hmm. locally complete. And therefore, right. locally, we have existence of geodesics. Okay, so we have small, uh, small geodesics for... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so he said that right. when, when you talk about geodesic, you talk about length minimizing curves. I'm talking about length minimizing curves. I'm in fact talking about um, 
I'm talking about isometries of the real uh, of isometries of the line segment with the Euclidean distance. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at paths into omega that are isometries with respect to the Euclidean distance in the domain and the Kobayashi distance in the target. Right? Okay. Thank or you. In, in other words, lambda equal to one and kappa equal to zero. This is a I think it's global. He's, he's asking whether this is a local definition. No, it is a global definition. It's completely global. Yes. Which means that I owe you certain explanations, which I plan to come to in a moment. Uh, so I, I want to point out that lambda kappa almost geodesics, uh, they are quasi-geodesics, but they are good quasi-geodesics. They are absolutely continuous with control on the length of sigma prime, wherever sigma prime exists. Uh, I'm going to come to the, the rationale for looking at this definition uh, towards the end of this talk. but. This is completely global, and the reason for making a concept, making a definition like this, is if I have a domain that's Kobayashi hyperbolic, then if you give me any kappa, provided kappa is not zero, you give me any two points, they can be as far apart as possible, there will exist a one kappa almost geodesic that connects these two points. Uh, so this is, in fact, an important point because this is not a local definition, it's a global definition. And so here is a sketch of the proof. So fix your x and your favorite x and y, and you want to fix a kappa not equal to zero. So the Gautam? Uh, let me complete this proof and you'll see a problem. Uh, I cannot guarantee that they are necessarily C1, uh, but, but I would not care. All right. And I do want to, I will address this at the end of this proof. In fact, this, this proof addresses all of these issues. Uh, so the thing is that if you look at the relationship between the Kobayashi distance and the Kobayashi pseudometric, uh, you, we have fixed a kappa over here. So if necessary, take two times kappa, and you will find a piecewise C1 smooth path joining X and Y, so that the length of this path as reckoned by the the Kobayashi pseudometric. So the integrated length of this part is less than or equal to uh, k omega of x comma y plus two kappa. And so now I have room to play and I had by definition a piecewise C1 path. I can wiggle it a little bit so that I in fact have a C1 smooth path uh, 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 joining x and y and such that gamma prime of t is, is everywhere, non-zero. So this is a familiar function. So this is a function that allows me to measure the, the length as reckoned by the Kobayashi metric up to time t. Now, Kobayashi hyperbolicity confers on kappa omega enough regularity. Now, this kappa omega is not jointly continuous in the two entries if I merely in, uh, in, uh, assume Kobayashi hyperbolicity. But it confers just enough regularity that the Euclidean norm of gamma prime is comparable to uh, the, the Kobayashi length of gamma prime for all t. So this implies that this function is strictly increasing. So that is why I wanted gamma prime of t to be non-zero. So this is a strictly increasing function. And in fact, it is a bi Lipschitz function. And, and now you can kind of see where I'm going with this because uh, my, um, my desired uh, um, uh, lambda kappa, uh, one kappa almost geodesic is simply this gamma reparametrized 
according to arc length, where the arc length is rec reckoned with respect to the Kobayashi metric. So, so therefore, oops, sorry. So therefore, this inequality with lambda equals one is, is it, it almost follows if I can, if I can just justify this intuition. And because the regularity of this integral is kind of screwed up, when I reparameterize this gamma, so the, the sigma that I want is simply gamma composed with phi inverse, the regularity of this composition also gets screwed up, but it gets screwed up only by, by a small amount. What I have at the end of the day is, is, is an absolutely continuous path. Um, one can look at domains that are Kobayashi hyperbolic and sufficiently pathological that in general, we can't expect these to be C1 split. So that was a proof sketch. Okay, so now I come to the, neg uh, the two notions of negative curvature uh, that underlie this, uh, that, that underpin this whole talk. And this is a notion of visibility uh, for these, these metric spaces. And these are metric spaces where I cannot assume properness. Um, but let me give you a definition first. Uh, if This is the definition of the end compactification. So if I have a locally compact space that admits an exhaustion by compacts, and if I fix an ascending sequence K mu, of compact subsets so that the, their interiors cover X with, with this at the, in the background. An end, let's call and give it a name, an end is simply a decreasing sequence of connected open sets, U sub nu alpha, where, all right. where um, each U sub mu alpha is some connected component of the complement of the mu of compact up here. And so the topology, so the end compactification is X together with all of these ends, all of these alphas. And let me tell you what the open neighborhoods of an alpha are. So the topology of the end compactification of X is such that each of these u, u sub nu alphas together with this, this abstract point alpha is an open neighborhood of, of the point alpha. And then, well, you'll say, doesn't this kind of depend on the choice of k sub nu, et cetera, et cetera. And we can sort of write this out more categorically. Uh, but the key point over here is that there is an if, if I look at two different ascending sequences, k sub nu, then there's a natural bijection between the set of ends determined by one such ascending sequence and some other ascending sequence. All right. So this is sort of the definition of visibility that I have been hinting at for like almost two thirds of this talk. You have a Kobayashi hyperbolic domain. Uh, we call omega a visibility domain with respect to the Kobayashi distance if for each lambda greater than or equal to one and kappa greater than or equal to zero. And for each pair of points, psi and eta, distinct points lying in the boundary of the end compactification of omega closure. And given a pair of open neighborhoods with respect to the closure in the topology of the end compactification that are well separated. Given these items, given this data, there is a compact that depends only on this data with the following property. And this is exactly the property that you saw pictorially, which is that for any lambda kappa almost geodesic, that originates in u psi and terminates in u eta, the, that almost geodesic int always intersects k. 
So kind of get either one of these two pictures with the proviso that we may not know whether we have geodesics. So we work with lambda kappa almost geodesics. Okay, but here's another weaker notion of visibility. So a weak visibility domain with respect to the Kobayashi distance is one where everything that I described happens, but we, we consider just lambda equal to one, which is to say that we have control on a smaller collection of, of almost geodesics. So this is a more permissible, it's a weaker notion of visibility. And so you might have questions at this stage, all right, great. Uh, why two notions of visibility? Well, firstly, uh, they are in fact distinct notions. I'm, I'm kind of tentative about this because this is work in progress. So clearly, Visibility domains impose control on arbitrary lambda kappa almost geodesics of a certain kind for all lambda greater than or equal to one. So in particular, they, they impose the desired control on one kappa almost geodesics. So all visibility domains are weak visibility domains. But um, it turns out that a certain class of uh, Kobayashi Gromov hyperbolic domains, by which I just mean uh, uh, domains equipped with the Kobayashi distance that happen to be Gromov hyperbolic. These are convex domains constructed by Zimmer in 2017, happen to be examples that examples of domains that are weak visibility domains, but are not in fact visibility domains. Uh, but there is kind of a more substantive uh, difference because these notions are useful and they are useful for doing two different kinds of things. Uh, so both these notions of, of visibility, what they do is they regulate the boundary behavior of uh, certain kinds of embeddings into these domains to varying extents. So what does visibility do? So imposing visibility in the co-domain controls continuous quasi-isometric embeddings. Everything is with respect to Kobayashi distances. Continuous quasi-isometric embeddings of Gromov hyperbolic spaces, which enables continuous extensions of these guys to the Gromov boundary. Weak visibility is a weaker property. It is not in general going to be good enough to achieve the result that I hinted at above, but a weak visibility um, on the target domain achieves what I said above, but this time only for isometries, not for quasi-isometric embeddings. So they are good for differing purposes. And going back to our framing device, which is wolf, uh, wolf dargeois theorems. Uh, so for the setting that we are interested in, domains in CN, Kobayashi hyperbolic, holomorphic self-map, what is the notion of, of, of uh, um, uh, negative curvature that, that is uh, appropriate? I, I do not know whether weak visibility is strong enough to do the job, but visibility certainly is. All right, now another question is, well, why all of uh, uh, the to-do about having these quasi-geodesics be better than continuous? Why, why this degree of control? Well, A, because we can, the proof is fairly elementary, but this extra degree of control is actually extremely useful in proofs. And in particular, they are, uh, they, this property, this additional control gives us an extremely usable sufficient condition uh, for, for a domain to be a visibility domain. So let me give you a criterion 
Unfortunately, I will absolutely not have the time to prove this because I think I think I have just a couple of minutes. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. So let me uh, quickly state a result and simply say that an extremely large class of domains that are natural in the study of study of several complex variables happen to be visibility domains. So delta is going to uh, represent the distance, the Euclidean distance from the boundary. And m sub omega is this gadget. But basically what this gadget does is it measures the extent to which a domain uh, admits big analytic disks close to the boundary. So that's what this gadget really captures. And so this is a result. And again, the two different teams of authors here represent two different stages of the generalization, weakening of the sufficient condition, which is I start out with a hyperbolic domain. Uh, suppose there exists a C1 smooth strictly increasing function f such that uh, f of t blows up as t approaches infinity. And I have some point Z naught in omega so that the Kobayashi distance of any point from Z naught is dominated by F applied to the reciprocal of the distance of Z from the boundary. So suppose I have such an F and assume that this gadget M sub omega converges to zero as T approaches zero. Suppose I have a positive parameter such that this integral is this integral converges, then omega is a visibility domain with respect to the Kobayashi distance. So, I mean, at some level, this is crazy, right? I mean, I have a very, very, very analytical gadget and somehow this uh, gives us uh, some negative curvature type condition. How? Well, quick remark. Well, the way this is proved, and this is going to justify the statement I made about the usability of working with lambda, kappa, almost geodesics, which is that, um, that uh, let's assume that omega that satisfies this property is not a visibility domain. Then we arrive at a contradiction and the contradiction is just a giant exercise in the use of the arzema ascoli theorem. Because if you assume you, you are not a visibility domain, domain, you're going to get a sequence of lambda kappa almost geodesics. And the, uh, well, I'm not going to scroll back very many slides, but the control on kappa omega, the, this is the Kobayashi length on sigma prime for almost every t, this actually gives us a Lipschitz condition. So there's a Euclidean Lipschitz condition that I can deduce on a lambda kappa almost geodesic coming from the control on this kappa sub omega of sigma prime of t for almost every t. Well, Lipschitz with respect to Euclidean means I have equal continuity. And uh, I think I'll leave this at that. This is enough of a hint. And I'm just going to wind up by flashing this slide. Uh, essentially showing that this notion of visibility embraces like an enormous span of domains. Uh, first of all, uh, this in fact embraces a class of domains, convex domains, which are domains that have line segments in the boundary. And boundary flat enough that the boundary admits points that are mildly infinite type in the sense of the angelo. Uh, what should be interesting to a lot of people in the audience here is that any C infinitely smoothly bounded pseudoconvex domain of the angular finite type is an example of a visibility domain. Um, uh, the project with Zimmer that I had referenced right in the first one minute of this talk involved talking about the properties of a class of domains, which definitionally were domains having these two properties. 
So these two classes of domains that I talked about, these, these convex domains that, that for which you are able to have line segments in the boundary, weakly pseudo-convex domains of finite type, they are simply instantiations of Goldilocks domains. And I don't have any more time, I'm already beyond past time. So I am going to simply go back to an earlier slide and say that there were these two notions of visibility. The significant distinction between these two notions, the stronger and the weaker, is what they are able to achieve. And one of the uh, 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 canonical results that uses this machinery is the continuous extension of continuous quasi-isometries to the Gromov boundary. Weak visibility most likely is not going to achieve that, but it is an excellent condition, excellent minimal condition for the continuous extension of isometries to the Gromov boundary of the, of the domain. I'll, I'll stop here, that's, that's all. Thank you so much for listening. Questions, speaker, the room. Uh, we have one. Yes, I uh, see a hand raise. Okay, there, there is. A... Okay, maybe Bas goes first. Uh huh. Yeah. A nice talk. Um, Thank you. So, um, you say you started off with these danger wool theorems. You say it's motivated by that. So, and then. Um, you say this visibility notion allows you to prove uh, danger wool theorems for these domains? Yes, yes. So they are slightly weaker than the classical uh, danger wool theorems. Uh, so these are more in the, along the lines of what Carlson was mentioning, somewhat weak danger wool. Um, so this is the sort of result that we can prove. Uh, so we pick up a visibility domain uh, and you know, I do want some degree on the control of the iterates of a holomorphic self map to be able to extract convergent subsequences. So I want this additional condition of topness. Uh, a priori visibility alone does not translate into topness, so I need to add this by hand. So if I have a taut and a bound, taut bounded visibility domain, then I have sort of a weakish uh, um, wolf dajwa theorem, which is we have the following dichotomy. Uh, either every orbit under the iteration of F is relatively compact, or if there is even one Z for which the orbit starting out at Z is not relatively compact, then in fact, there is a wolf point and all orbits under the iteration are dragged towards the wolf point. So yeah, so visibility does give us a, a Dajwa-Wolf theorem, but the dichotomy is weaker. Uh, the fixed point case, in, in fact, there are examples. Um, I'm sorry, but um, you have <laughs> alpha nu here. So this is a subsequence. So the geometry of the total attractor. No. Oh, no, no. Uh, uh, no, when, uh, I think, no, this is, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I sort of like to say the iterative power, I like to write it as circle mu. So mm -hmm. circle mu means the new iterate. Oh, sorry, circle yeah. mu. So, so yeah, so again, uh, with, with topness, it is totally trivial that some, if, if this property doesn't hold, then some subsequence of iterates will converge to a boundary point. But in fact, I am saying that if, if there is even one non-relatively compact orbit of the iteration, then if every orbit, the full orbit, not some subsequence thereof, is dragged off to a wolf point. Right. Yeah, so this is not an alpha, it's just, just a tiny Sorry, no, circle. Yeah, it's, it's quite small on my laptop screen. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this says that the, basically the full attractor is a single point. Yes, yes. And, and basically your assumptions on your map allow you to translate 
things of the orbits into these quasi-geodesics that sort of orbits? Kind of. So what happens is, um, you see, if... Um, so the first thing I want to rule out is when I look at uh, the cluster set of the collection of iterates of F, uh, I should sort of have a simple cluster set. Um, I shouldn't have as limits of the family of iterates, non-constant holomorphic maps in the boundary. Uh, but uh, this is exactly where tautness actually tautness. Now, visibility does a rather interesting thing. Um, it turns out one of the geometrical consequences of visibility is that a domain that is bounded and a visibility domain cannot have any, um, any uh, positive dimensional analytic varieties in the boundary. So tautness tells me that the, the limits, the limit set of the family of iterates are just points. But yes, once this guarantee is done, if I assume that there are two distinct limit points, then I look at iterates, different subsequences of iterates approaching these two distinct points, and oh, then yeah, I join them by do. wayside. Okay. Yes. Right. So it's so the maybe one remark, and maybe Anders will agree with me. Actually, you set it up in the terminology of Bearden, but Anders has a paper with Noskov where he has this condition <clears throat> uh, using the Gromov product uh, for Hilbert yes. geometries. Right. And yes. um, that is sort of it only works between pairs of sequences, and you have uh, you have whole collections of. Uh, sequences of right. So um, I think it's more in the spirit of actually the, the Carlson Noskov uh, ID actually there. Um, yeah. So maybe that's just a remark. Oh yeah. yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so I have uh, uh, this question. So if you consider a space which is uh, hyperbolic, mm -hmm. but not complete hyperbolic, uh -huh. I think you can always embed uh, into a complete, isometrically into a complete metric. Ah, uh, yes, but it is a mess because yeah. the, so, yeah. <laughs> my question were uh, if you thought of uh, this embedding and the relation of visibility in your actual space and in this, uh, complete metric space? Um, so somehow, so the answer is yes. And um, a better framework for uh, trying to relate uh, the, the abstract completion of a uh, incomplete hyperbolic space uh, with this framework of visibility is actually this notion of weak visibility. So this was, since this was very distant from anything I wanted to talk about, um, I didn't mention this, but another sense in which the notion, the weak notion of visibility involving one kappa almost geodesics is a win, is that um, one is able to, um, Assuming visibility, that is assuming weak visibility, and looking, sort of going through the paper by Bonk and Schramm, line by line by line, uh, one is um, able to um, have a more geometrical idea of the, the completion. Uh, of a hyperbolic space constructed by very different means in the bog Schramm paper. Uh, to do this, I need, the, I need some kind of visibility. 
And somehow everything is more transparent when, when we work with a weak notion of visibility, but that is good you know, because this is the weak visibility is a more permissive notion of negative curvature. Uh, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So just starting with hyperbolicity and nothing else, I, I don't think that's a very helpful situation because uh, for one thing, um, weak visibility. So if, if, if you look at a one kappa geodesic ray, not a geodesic, but a geodesic ray that exits from every compact set. Uh, I think um, it's many of us in this audience have sort of enough experience with metric geometry to see how the notion of weak visibility will impose a control on the oscillation of such a almost geodesic ray. Uh, so, so some minimal behavior on uh, on almost geodesic rays is sort of a prerequisite. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ah, okay. So. Uh, you mean in, in this theorem? Yeah, I, I actually didn't, uh, did not mention this. Um, and um, so there is, I think because I was anxious to, to state one theorem and a sketch of a proof, there were a couple of supplementary comments that I did not make. Um, so the, the reason why I kind of insist on the end compactification uh, in, uh, in, in this particular framework, and I sort of had the, the wolf dajwa theorem as my framing device, uh, Baz mentioned that well, um, you know, looking at the end compactification can be kind of restrictive. Well, the answer is, um, you know, the Kobayashi distance on a hyperbolic domain is already, the boundary behavior thereof is already in, in general so, uh, so difficult to understand that, now I come to the answer of your question, this was a preamble, that in general, it is, pretty difficult, pretty, pretty difficult to have an understanding of the Gromov boundary in, in this setting. And so it would be kind of vacuous, at least I feel, to have a wolf dajwa theorem where the wolf point sits on the Gromov boundary, which is in general a very abstract object. So in general, we don't know. However, um, there is, if, if we again allow certain minimal conditions, like the condition of, um, so here I would actually like to mention another notion of visibility, uh, which is very similar to this one that I defined. this weak notion of visibility. And this is a notion in recent work by Bracci, uh, Nikolov and Toma, which is have this property, but start out with a omega that is complete hyperbolic, in which case you do have Kobayashi geodesics connecting pairs of points. Uh, so instead of talking about one kappa almost geodesics, just redo this definition with geodesics. So the result is this, that if you start off with a domain that is complete hyperbolic, then if the domain in fact has 
uh, the notion of visibility that I just described, then, uh, then the Gromov boundary is canonically homeomorphic to the boundary of the end compactification. And what do I mean by canonically uh, homeomorphic? I mean that the identity mapping from omega to itself has a canonical extension to the Gromov boundary, which turns out to be a homeomorphism from the Gromov boundary onto the boundary of the end compactification. So to summarize, in general, the answer to your question, in general, one doesn't know, at least I don't know. But in this particular special case, um, there's, there's a, like almost a visual understanding of the Gromov boundary, which is that there is a canonical homeomorphism of the Gromov boundary to the boundary of the end compactification. I think you need the Galtam, I think you need the, that you don't have geodesic loops, otherwise the map Oh, uh, sorry, I, 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 yeah, I, I dropped a condition, Gromov hyperbolic. I mean, to be able to talk about a Gromov boundary, we need Gromov hyperbolicity, right? But if you are proper and Gromov hyperbolic, then a geodesic loops are censored out, correct? Uh, no, you, you don't want to have geodesic loops in the Euclidean realization of the domain. For, for Gromov, it's always the case. Right. Like if you take the disk minus the line. Um, Disk minus a line, yes. Uh, let's see. Yes, but um, uh, haven't you proved along with uh, Nikolov and uh, and and uh, Toma that if you start off with a complete hyperbolic Gromov hyperbolic domain, then uh, the domain being visible. Oh, I see. Okay, the identity only extends as a continuous, surge, yes, continuous exactly. surface map. And if there yeah. are no geodesic loops right. in the okay. realization, yes. then it's an homeomorphism. Okay, yeah. So, sorry, I missed a condition. But again, there are lots of geometrical examples where this condition, which is that um, geodesic loops in the Euclidean realization don't exist. And this is having a boundary that's sufficiently well curved. But yes, uh, again, to go back to the question that was asked to me, um, uh, I think uh, the broadest framework in which we understand what the Gromov boundary looks like is a framework where we have this notion of visibility that I mentioned. And I'm foreshadowing a work that is in progress. That condition is equivalent to this weak visibility condition that I stated. So under this framework with this additional condition, um, one can find a, a number of additional uh, geometrical hypotheses, um, which give us a large collection of domains but, but the slogan here is for a large collection of domains, uh, the Gromov boundary, quote unquote, looks like the boundary of the end compactification. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. I think he left, he left the, the, the end raised. Bas, uh, I think, have another I question? Th no, I think with Bas, it was, he raised his hand and maybe uh, forgot to, uh, yeah. what is the opposite of raised? Sorry, sorry, historic. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, that was a historic hand raise, okay. Okay, okay. okay well, uh, I think in that case, uh, let us thank the speaker again. Thanks so much. I think we start again at 2.30. Yes. Correct. Thank you, Donald.